Aloha and welcome to Cooper Union, what's happening with human rights around the world. And today we'll be looking at civil society striving for sustainable development, grassroots groups going for the 17 global goals. Today we're very fortunate to be joined by activists from around the world who have been very involved with the sustainable development goals and have also been involved in the process of accountability known as the Voluntary National Review. We're very fortunate to be able to hear from them from their direct experiences in their community, in the capitals, but also at global civil society, where we all to come together at the UN headquarters around the UN high level political forum to make significant change. I'd like to welcome Judith. Judith, thank you so much. How did you first get involved with the SDGs and why are they so important? Thanks, Josh, and thanks for having me. Um, I actually, I'm in Zimbabwe, where I'm working with an organization that is into police advocacy. So we were already doing work around police advocacy anyway. And we were also involved with the Millennium Development Goals with our partner, Cafford. So through that work um, as an organization, we're already aware of the genesis that the, the, the global development uh, was, was going. So we were aware of the SDGs coming into force. So when they came into force, we had learned lessons working on the SDGs as a single organization and realized that we're not making much impact in terms of even uh, engaging government. So when the SDGs came into force in, 20, in 2015, we had lessons then, which meant we needed to involve other organizations to bring together civil society and work around that. And we, with the, we had realized the importance of awareness raising because with the MDGs, they ended and some people didn't even know that they were MDGs. So we, we, we were involved in terms of awareness raising. We, we did radio programs in conjunction with the UN family, with the government itself. So we went on a number of radio programs where we were raising awareness about the, about the SDGs. And also as a way of ensuring that we have a broader participation of civil society, my organization, initiated uh, what we are calling the Zimbabwe Civil Society Reference Group on SDGs, where we bring together sector apex organizations that represent women, that represent older persons, that represent the media, the youth, and um, uh, uh, all other sectors. So we, at the moment, we have more than 15 apex organizations which each is about over a hundred membership going to grassroots level. So they are working as conduits now for then uh, sensitizing people about the SDGs, getting information in terms of monitoring the implementation. So that's how we are working in Zimbabwe uh, around the SDGs. Yeah. Thank you so much. And that does remind me a lot about the MDG campaign and all the work that we did. And I love your idea of the reference book, and I have a lot of questions to follow up with. But we'll go to Carol in Mexico. Could you share us how you began to get involved and how the SDGs have been a positive platform for promoting human rights and social development? Sure. Uh, well, so there's like a, like a hybrid story there. There's the involvement that I got at the personal level while I was still a student. I studied international relations, so quite a reference for us was, of course, the MDGs. And then I had the opportunity to land my first job at the UN headquarters right after I graduated. So it was right at the negotiations of, um, of the transition between the MDGs to the SDGs in 2013. And then I encounter one of the mechanisms that the UN facilitated, which you might remember was the MIRO 2030 survey, which back then was really successful. So I was in charge of facilitating through a youth group. I mean, 10 years ago, I was only 20, 24. Um, so I had the opportunity to, to lead a youth group then, and the, 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 the campaign be, the game to start to come up with, as an organization. So we became Iro Mexico. So we've been uh, involved kind of like a more youth led organizations ever since the design of the SDGs were done in 20, 2015. And then we became a, an, a social business actually that works. It, kind of like a lot with civil society led efforts and we continue to lead campaigns which are completely voluntary led. 
but that's kind of like how we did it. We started with the with a survey that kind of like uh, um, caught the interest of many many organizations in 2015, and then we established an organization that today ha has five programs that focus on socializing the SDGs, on helping the private sector and local governments to kind of like translate that into public policy. We have a program for kids, so we accompany schools as well. And we have a campaigns also program that kind of like leads campaigns throughout the year. We have the SDG Action Week coming up in September, for example. And then we have another one that basically provides services because uh, since we grew a lot, it started like a voluntary led effort, but it grew a lot uh, and got the attention from many sectors. They were the one like pushing us forward to establish an organization that will be able to provide services to help them do this at the institutional level with the SDGs. So that's how I got involved. So now it's an organization with um, with uh, at least 37 people working on the five different programs that we have. And we have uh, more than 100 member organizations. And we still have a lot of uh, volunteers leading different efforts with the SDGs. So it's kind of like a crazy journey, but that's how it started. Although that's an excellent example of really actualizing the 2030 agenda at home. And it's exciting because we also did those surveys. I remember doing those surveys at Earth Day and different events, and it was just a way to begin the conversation around the world. So that's exciting, but I did too. We'll now move to Kathy, who's focusing on the SDGs in China. Kathy, how are you and how did you get involved with the SDGs? And why are they so important to you? Yeah, and, and first, thanks for having me as well. Um, actually, although um, my nationality, I am a Chinese citizen, but actually my focus on SDGs has been uh, more from an international level and um, in terms of how I got involved. Um, I think I started with SDG 13 um, on climate, and um, which is still my, my main focus uh, you know, right now. Um, so basically, I, I follow the SDG 13 from the youth perspective and also from a women and gender perspective. Um, and yeah, and also then it, it sort of like expanded because SDG 13 and because all the SDG girls are mutually reinforcing and from SDG 13, of course, um, I'm also the contact point of the youth constituency of UNFCCC on ocean. So there's also SDG 14 and also um, as the youth constituency of UNFCCC, we work very closely with the youth constituency of our sister convention, the CBD. So um, also 15 and then also um, at uh, on climate, one of my main focus is technology. So besides, so basically my main focus are technology, finance, capacity building, and a few others. But yeah, technology, of course, is highly related to energy. So seven, and also because I follow climate um, from a youth perspective and a women and gender perspective that also touch base on SDG5. So yeah, many nexus um, in between. So that's um, in terms of how I got involved. Yeah, basically. Thank you. And it's, it's true when you look at the interconnectedness of the SDGs, what's important is maybe what Judith can get into is how we expanded the MDGs from those eight to the 17 sustainable development goals. And it was a big campaign to make sure that SDG five, focusing on gender justice, was still in existence. Also, SDG six on the right to water. I remember Palau really leading the way on that to recognize really those first seven are sort of economic, social, and cultural rights. Uh, maybe Judith, can you share on why it was so important to expand from eight to 17? And I think the other point that maybe we can all share is why the leave no one behind is so significant in the transition from MDGs to SDGs, as well as furthest behind first, and how that's been a guiding principle in the work that you do in Zimbabwe, as well as Mexico and around the world. Judith? Uh, th thanks, Joshua. I think the world just realized that um, the reality is poverty anywhere is poverty everywhere. Uh, so really, we know that with the MDGs, it was almost like it's meant for the global south to implement with the global north giving technical support and all that. But then development, especially in this globalized world, does not work like that because we are now one global village. So if there's negligence in terms of addressing whether it's human rights, whether it's poverty, whether it's gender issues in one corner of the globe, invariably it is going to affect 
and impact in one way or another to the rest of the world. So I guess that was the realization. So really, I think it, it is important that um, by broadening uh, the, the SDGs to, to cover all aspects of human life and to ensure that it's development for all, not leaving anyone behind. And that all the UN member states that signed onto it are committing to implement for themselves and by extension for the rest of, for the, rest of the world. So it's important in that way. The, I think the MDGs were too limited, focused on a few things. And even in terms of saying we want to have poverty, meaning the other half was already condemned to be left behind. So, so the, 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 the SDGs really are, are broader moving like that. Joshua, what was your next question? <laughs> what well, was the well, other part it, of the question? It was exactly that of the leaving no one behind and furthest behind first yes. and how that's guided your work in Zimbabwe. It, it, it guides our work in the sense, it like, like what I shared with you with the reference group, where there are organizations that work at grassroots level, doing various interventions. Some are into direct support, some are into provision of services, and it's mostly for the marginalized. And especially um, drawing from Zimbabwe, where the economy is not doing very well. So while it is the government's obligation to meet the needs of its people, it always fails to do that. So civil society comes in to complement what government is doing. So the SDGs are really key in that um, it gives room for civil society to come in and fill the gap, the development gap that is left by government's inability to meet all the needs of its people. And because they work, most of these organizations work at grassroots level, it means um, those that are usually left out in the national development interventions, they have an opportunity of their needs being addressed through the work of civil society. And when you are um, informed um, and you are placing your work on the leave no one behind, it means there is that consciousness that we need to have everybody on board. So civil society plays a key role in terms of complementing government efforts to meet the needs of the marginalized. Thank you. And Carol, can you share the same response looking at Mexico and the work that you're doing there? Yeah, I think that from the very design of the sustainable development goals, it was clear that it got people's attention to participate. I mean, the numbers were there, the stakeholders were there in a demand. Even if you if you go back to September 25th when Malala and a few of us were there, the call was clear. Like we're looking at you was because we adopted collectively. This is something that didn't happen with the MDGs. As you know, they were adopted closed doors. They didn't have a consultation. They were basically the, the demands of the global north with the global south and stuff like that. So, and we had a totally different world, even though it was only 20 years ago, it was it's totally different from what we have now. So the challenges increase, the accountability increase. We have technology on our side to make people participative in this process. Um, and of course, uh, we have bigger issues that need collective action. I mean, COVID is a great example of this. What happened in one place in the world can impact another completely different part of the world. So we need to revalue how important the SDGs are when you look at all of the international processes, because this is the first time that we put so many ambitions together in one place. We know what to do. We have the responses there to make it happen. They're not perfect because many things were left aside, of course. But this is something that definitely make a, a, a turning point when it came to the SDGs. I, 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 I witnessed it at a grassroots level. People wanted to be involved in an international process. People wanted their priorities to be there. People were clear about the fact that governments are, are not, are not going to go Cover all, cover all of the needs and the urgencies that we have. So people wanted to be involved. And I think that we as civil society need to keep that spirit forward and even expand it because we now have the, the answers that we have the plan there, but we need to get more people, more stakeholders, uh, more sectors involved. So in the case of Mexico, and what again, what I've witnessed uh, at the grassroots level is that interest, especially from youth. I would say that something that it's, 
to stand out of this agenda is the role that young people are having, people fighting for climate justice, people fighting for uh, gender equality, inequalities, and other forms of, you know, uh, involvement. And you see that, that we're going to, uh, maybe we're going to talk about the HLPF, but the HLPF, it's becoming bigger and bigger because of the interest of the young people. That's something to applaud and that's something to to keep pushing forwards because we're looking at what governments are doing, but we also know about the responsibility that we have as sectors to implement and make the as much as we can the, the targets of the SDGs uh, together. And you might remember they were involved in the consultations that the first uh, draft that some of the first drafts that we have from the SDGs have more than 17 SDGs cover much more of, uh, of what we wanted to be to be there. But unfortunately, that went through intergovernmental negotiations and some of the things had to be cut down. But that gives us a good precedent for the next agenda. We need to start talking and thinking about what's going to come after the the twenty after twenty thirty, and maybe that's that stuff that was left behind is going to be included now. And the, the agenda is clear: the integrity of the five pillars of the agenda, people, planet, prosperity, partnerships, and peace are key for moving us forward. And that implies no leave, leaving no one behind people, but also not leaving behind our planet, which is something that unfortunately we have done for so long. So, so that's a little bit of our experience here. No, oh, that's great. And that brings up the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Report that just came out on Monday. It also highlights really that we have economic, social, cultural rights in the SDGs. We have fair economy, we have climate justice, and we have peace, justice, human rights, and partnerships, new partnerships, where we all work together, where it's not that traditional development model that existed that didn't really empower and engage people. And so, Kathy, how have you been involved with the Leave No One Behind and Furthest Behind First? And what are some of those aspects? Yeah, and first, I, I really echo with, um, what my, my, my co-panelists just mentioned. Um, and also the IPCC report, uh, because actually by profession, I work in private finance and um, my job has nothing to do with climate change and um, I'm just in a private finance team. And, but actually like after the IPCC report was released, many colleagues, no matter they work on climate, no matter they, they don't work on climate, they're talking about it. And also I, I think it is, you know, it, it does raise people's awareness tremendously. And, and of course it is a code red for, for all of us. And it also like, I also echo it that we do need to start thinking about the next agenda and also in terms of um, not to leave anyone behind because my main focus is on the youth constituency and women and gender constituency. Of course, what we advocate for is not to leave us behind the civil society stakeholders, namely youth, women and indigenous peoples. And, and of course, we, we play very critical roles and we are key stakeholders that should be, that we have the rightful role to be like included in all the process making and in all processes and also in, in all aspects of their work. Um, and of course that we're there to sort of um, push the government forward a little bit um, to make sure they don't stay in their comfort zone. And it also um, in terms of, I really echoed that SDGs of course really gave the room for civil society stakeholders to really fill the gap of, of governments. And also of course we, we have always been urging um, all the constituted bodies of the conventions to really include um, stakeholders and also urge uh, the parties of the conventions to really include stakeholders from innovation to implementation of no matter it's national NDCs of, of, in terms of climate or any other um, SDGs related. Um, and also speaking of like youth in Mexico, I really echo with that as well. Um, and also that Mexico as a party of the climate convention, they, they do have like a strong agenda on gender youth and indigenous peoples. And we, we probably all remember like how, how they supported uh, the gender action plan in 2019. So yeah, that was great memory. Oh, really, really good points. And it brings together a lot of the significant aspects. Of course, Monday was World Indigenous Peoples Day. Today is International Youth Day. And we all know it's not just a day. And when you look at what happened at the Voluntary National Review in the 2030 agenda, and what happened at the high level political forum, you really do have aims and aspirations, you have ambitions and actions, but what we bring in civil society focuses on is that accountability. We look at what are the success and the shortcomings of the SDG. Uh, what was exciting just a month ago is there was the high level political forum and over 40 countries had 
There are voluntary national reviews take place. Judith, could you begin to share with us what happened in Zimbabwe during the last year leading up to the voluntary national review? Yeah, th th thank you, uh, Josh. Um, actually, what we what happened in Zimbabwe, there was a lot of excitement precisely because the government was presenting its second voluntary national review. So what we have observed is the year that the government is presenting, it presented its first voluntary national review in 2017. There was a, a lot of hype that time as well. And then in between, there was almost a lull speak less and less about SDGs. But then they, they, there was a reawakening again when it was preparing to be pre presenting its second voluntary national review. So the, in terms of government, it was busy uh, working around uh, coming up with that voluntary national review. And what we did as civil society organizations, in 2017, when government was coming up, we wanted to input into that process. but we were not really uh, organized, if I may say it, because we're learning as well. That's when we put together the reference group and we're just still trying to learn how to come together and what to do about it. But we did make our contributions. But uh, this year, we were a little bit more organized because through networking with colleagues around the globe, you will, we learned a lot. We all we networked with organizations like Action for Sustainable Development. We have we have put up this people's scorecard, which has really become a very useful tool. So that's the tool that we use this time round to do the civil society spotlight report. And what we have always said in Zimbabwe is um when we do the spotlight report, it's not necessarily to try and antagonize government. But it's a tool to engage. To, it's a tool to bring accountability from government. So we informed government from the very word go that a civil society, we were working on this scorecard and they were anxious to see it and to see what was coming out of it, but in a very amicable way. So we did use the scorecard to, 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 to develop the people's, court, the people's spotlight report. And we shared at each stage with the government that engaged a consultant to work on the voluntary national review. So at each stage, we were sharing our findings because the time was very limited up to the time that we had the final report. So there was a lot of excitement, a lot of activity, both in government and in civil society. So we did come together through the reference group, which I said earlier brings together APEC sector organizations across all sectors in civil society. So there was participation through those organizations to get input of even grassroots people. We know it's time of COVID, so there were no physical meetings, but they were able to use their structures, to use online platforms to get input from, from, from uh, their membership to then consolidate into that civil society report. So we did uh, really work together is a broader uh, civil society organization to bring together the, the, the spotlight report. We also have an umbrella organization for civil society in Zimbabwe, which is structures and chapters. So we did collaborate with them as the reference group to then broaden the participation to in terms of then coming together with this position of civil society around the voluntary national review. But yes, government did present its second um, voluntary national review uh, this year. Um, and a civil society, even during the presentation, uh, we made a statement. So a, 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 a youth from Zimbabwe was able to make an intervention after the minister made a presentation of the voluntary national review, which, which was something that we celebrated because it has never happened before, yeah. Thank you so much, Judith, and it, and it does show how we're learning together and how we find those promising practices that another country does that we can then include in our voluntary national review. Thank you so much, Carol. How about Mexico? 
Well, this was Mexico's third voluntary national review, but it was the first time that this administration presented BNRs. Uh, we had a new presidency coming in 2018, so this was the first um, effort of the administration to present its uh, progress and hopefully challenges of, of SDG implementation. So there were several interesting aspects. I mean, we had the formal the formal procedure that kind of like included civil society in several consultations towards the construction of the of the report. So those happened and we participated on those. But then on the other side, uh, civil society was very active with a few spotlight reports. There was one uh, done ex especially through the uh, major group for indigenous peoples. Uh, we collaborated in the in the report of the volunteers major group and NGO major group. So we were involved in most of the position papers for that to make sure that the voices of civil society in different you know like forms will be presented to the major groups and one aspect that was very interesting to me and it's something that we try to encourage josh joshua through through several of our channels and the organizations that we work with which are hundreds it's to make sure that normal people know what the hlpf is and what it serves for and what stands for because this is the accountability mechanism for the sdgs annually and we still have a lot of countries that haven't presented BNRs, and if they do, they do it by closed doors, or they don't consult with civil society. So we need to kind of like, you know, kind of like step through the major groups to make sure that civil society is represented. And I know that many countries did that out of the more than 40 that presented. So in our case, we did participate in the formal consultations that the government facilitated, but we also made our own report and consultations. We were able to use several databases to, to kind of like capture people's voices through a, a survey. And then we also facilitated the civil society process for the intervention during the actual presentation of Mexico. So we, we made some very interesting questions. We have 140 organizations participating in a two minute position statement that that turn out to be one minute at the very last uh, time. And, but we managed to do it. And the, I think that one of the aspects that, again, I would value the most out of all this process is that we were able to engage new civil society, but also citizens who wanted to be involved in this process and understanding that they can participate in the side events, the labs, and all of these things. I mean, virtuality in that sense gave us an advantage, I would say, compared to other to other years. And as for the content of the VNR, which is another topic that we could have another call about, um, that always, you know, has its ups and downs. It's a very different perspective from what the government sometimes presents to what civil society is perceiving, and that's inevitable mm -hmm. to happen but they were receptive about it i do have to say that that despite that some changes that have happened in the government in terms of the position that the 2030 agenda had it was first position at the presidency level and they changed it to a ministry which is kind of like sad but they were receptive and and they did were open to have consultations i do have to say that and well yes that's to sum out a, a complete process Thank you, Carol. No, and, and, and that's important. And you bring up a point. Yes, uh, the United States has not gone yet. So in Hawaii, we organized the voluntary local review with over 100 civil society. And the point you brought up, as well as Judith, is those VNRs are too short. So we did a 90-minute VLR, voluntary local review, bringing together public, private, and public elected officials to actually have a deeper discussion about the SDGs and the Aloha Plus Challenge here in Hawaii. I know we're wrapping up. Kathy, is there anything you'd like to add about China and also about youth participation at the high level political forum? Yeah, I, I think um, because of course this year is quite important for China in terms of sustainable development because of the COP15 of this CBD. Um, I mean, at least we hope that will take place as planned. Um, of course, it is a great opportunity for, for China to show their ambition, but of course, there are also concerns, um, like we mentioned in, in the VNR that um, in, in our MGUS statement that, of course, we do appreciate their efforts in terms of like alleviating poverty and also a few other aspects. But of course, um, that many of our questions uh, in terms of civil society engagement have been uh, more or less ignored um, according to their answer. So yeah, there are definitely uh, challenges ahead. We definitely have to continue organizing. Uh, Mahalo Nui, thank you, civil society and amazing women leaders from around the world for sharing stories about the successes related to the SDGs. 
as well as new initiatives to improve our daily lives related to development and peace. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you.